Welcome and good afternoon. Welcome to today's event, which promises to be a stimulating discussion on the need for democratic renewal in Africa. This seminar is part of UNDP's series of Reimagining Development, which aims to contribute to a deeper conversation about the future of development on how we can reimagine the ways in which we address major challenges. So the question is, how do we reimagine development in Africa amidst military coups? How are coups impacting the Sustainable Development Goals? So why is this topic particularly important? Well, coups are reversing the developmental gains. Allow me to repeat that. Coups are reversing developmental gains. Since 2020, we have experienced eight military coups in Africa. These coups have occurred in the context where there is heightened insecurity, and which are further intensified by various different crises. Crisis of climate change, the fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic, and worsening humanitarian and food crisis. So this particular report, The Soldiers and Citizen and the Need for Democratic Renewal in Africa, is the first empirical-driven report that has been done of its kind. It offers the experiences of 8,000 African citizens and their lived experiences. Through these, we end up seeing the unique perspective and insights that they have to offer. Their views on understanding the challenges of transitioning uh, states, and it could also guide our collective insights on how do we respond differently in this current context. Joining us today, we have Dr. Jide Okeke, who's the Regional Program Coordinator in, in Africa, who brings a wealth of experience from the African Union and various different research think tanks. He led the re research report on soldiers and citizens and the need for democratic renewal in Africa. So we'll be hearing on the key findings of the report and the insights that it provides us in terms of resetting the Sahel, in terms of looking at new alternative ways of addressing these challenges. So before he presents the report, we want to watch a video to hear directly from the insights of the people that we spoke to and hearing directly from the 8,000 African citizen voices. So please watch the video and hear from them directly. From political turmoil to aspirations for transformative change, African citizens are finding themselves at a crossroads. Based on 8,000 stories, this film delves into the heart of Africa's democratic journey, where hope and disillusionment collide in a yearning for change. People talking about cool every now and then. Who knows? Socio-political and security situation in the West African region is characterized by worsening violence, particularly in the Sahelo-Saharan region. En l'absence de bonne gouvernance, le pays ne peut pas tenir. Et c'est exactement ce que nous voyons maintenant. It is important to continue investing in efforts to address the root causes which aggravate the conflicts, instability, and violence in the region. Without <laughs> تكون في تدخلات سواء كان عسكرية ولا تدخلات أيا كانت شكلها إن هي تحدث تغيير والتغيير اللي بيحدث صدمة بيكون تغيير ديمقراطي أو عن طريق المسارات المعروفة الصناديق الاقتراع. People think that once a party is in power, politicians, their friends, family, girlfriends, boyfriends, then it means that they have easy access to the resources of this country, where many people are wallowing in poverty. And the money that is supposed to be used to help the, the local person, they are using it to enrich themselves, which is too bad. People are not too sure of whether there are, are leaders who have been voted, voted in the power across the divide really are listening to the people. 
and really are there for the needs of the people. And so the question is, if you're not there for us, who are you there for? The absence of development policies or the existence of policies and programs that do not deliver inclusive development can act as a root cause of conflicts. More than 10,000 schools across the Sahel had to close, leaving millions of children unable to acquire. <laughs> They have free education, but then they don't have chairs to sit on. They have free education, but they don't have books to read. التأثير بتاع الانقلاب ده نفسه على حياتنا حياتنا العامة أو الحياة الاقتصادية مثلاً وقف حركة بتاع التصدير ومعرف التنقلات التدفق النقد الأجنبي ذاته التهويلات الخير وأثر في حياتنا الاقتصادية معظم الشباب أو معظم الناس هم ما قادرين يحققوا طموحهم أو ما قادرين يحققوا حتى ولو حاجات بسيطة عادي تموت بخطأ طبي أنت ممكن تموت من لأنك ما قادر تأكل زمانك ما في زوج بيموت بالجوع لكن السبيقة في مشردين في ناس انت حالات بتاعت انتحار كثيرة في ناس يعني الوضع صعب شديد لا العساكر اصلا من المفترض ما يكون عندهم دور في السياسه يعني العسكر ده احنا ما عرفنا انه دور بتاع امن ودفاع مفترض يعني يكون عندهم وزاره الدفاع فالسياسه للسياسيين يعني ما للعسكر الدور de déplorer que les femmes, c'est-à-dire plus de la moitié de la population ouest-africaine, continue d'être largement sous-représenté dans les structures de gouvernance et les processus de prise de décision. Despite the challenges of unemployment, corruption, entrenched political leadership and political violence, many African youth have found constructive avenues to promote peace, effective governance and reforms. اللي هم حاسي حاليا قاعدين ساعيين لي ورا انه يحققوا مطالبهم ويحققوا ويسمعوا صوتهم ويتكلموا عن 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 حاجات في جزء ما قادر انه هو يتكلم عنها. يعني النساء هم اكثر فئه من المجتمع قاعدين يتعرضوا للي بيحصل او بي يعني بيشيلوا النتيجه بتاعت الاخفاق الاخرين او القوى السياسيه او غيره لانهم هم دائما يعني قضاياهم قاعد تكون مؤجله يعني حتى لو تم اشراكهم كذا ما يعني القضايا بتاعتهم ما قاعد تكون في انصاف لها وما قاعد يعني بيتم تاجيلها دائما وبيكون حاجه ثانويه. لا ريبريزنتاتيفيتي دي لا فام اوسي ليسا ديزيري. سا كومانسي ديجا بار لو كوميتي تكنيك كي ديفي الابوري لا شارت. اون فام سور 15. سي سي ان درام. لي زورغانزون لا سوتي سيفيل sont une, constituent une force de proposition. Si certaines ont été cooptées, d'autres sont restées. Pourtant, nous avons vraiment envie de participer, et surtout au niveau des réformes. Mais on se rend compte au fur et à mesure que l'espoir que les gens avaient fourni sur la tension là est en train de, de, de tourner à autre chose. Quoi. 
Voilà. Et on peut taxer un peu même la transition de, de Caméléon, puisque au départ, il y a des choses qui nous avaient eu à dire et on se rend compte au fur et à mesure que ce n'est pas ce qui se passe. Cette situation nouvelle nous interpelle quant à la pertinence et la mise en œuvre des instruments dont nous nous sommes dotés pour prévenir les atteintes au constitutionnalisme et à l'alternance démocratique. You have several causes in this country, and we've seen how people have suffered. People have lost dear ones. People have, were humiliated. People were impoverished. People were killed. People killed themselves. People ran away from this country. This is the only country we have. That is why people have become so tolerant, and politicians are taking it for granted. We are peace-loving people. If we talk to everybody, anybody in the street, much as we are not happy with what is going on right now, they will tell you they don't want coups. We don't want coups. These stories challenge our perceptions of democracy, governance, and the role of the military, inspiring action for a better future. For more, visit soldiersandcitizens.org. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Okay. Good afternoon. Um, we don't want coups. I think that's the key message. And if you've listened and watched that video, I guess the basis is good to see you, Linia. Uh, why are we here? Uh, we're here to highlight a problem. And the reason why that problem should be highlighted is that when a problem converges with the right policies and the right politics, it creates opportunities. Uh, and so we are hoping uh, that by highlighting the resurgence of military coups and taking advantage of the policy environment that we have on the African continent and beyond, and the part through the partnerships that we've created, we can begin to advocate for the right politics to prevent coups and to strengthen our aspiration towards uh, sustainable development. So, in brief, the presentation that I have here is simply going to reinforce some of what you've already heard, right? around the report on soldiers and citizens. You would ask yourself, why did we decide to embark on a 20-month journey uh, to gather primary data and uh, attempt to understand coups on the African continent? There are so many other things that we could have done. But it's largely because of the resurgence that we experienced from, from 2020 to date. At the time when we launched this report on the 15th of July, uh, we had seen six successful coups. Today, we have eight successful coups. Since we launched the report just three months ago, we've also seen two additional coups. So it is not necessarily an exception. We are beginning to see this resurgence that needs to be understood and needs to be prevented. And as a development institute or organization, as UNDP, we thought it's important to also understand from a development lens what it means for the progress towards sustainable development. And so that nexus between political disruptive transitions and the impact it has on development is one that needs to be understood. And if one looks at coups in historic terms, what you find is that coups are not necessarily unique to any one sub-region on the African continent. In fact, you could make the argument that no one region is immune from military coups. Notwithstanding, our report did highlight that there's a sub-regional specificity that we need to acknowledge. The epicenter of coups historically has been in West Africa. And I'll come to that point later, because this is a region that coincides 
with the Sahelian belt, where we have found that there is persistent insecurity, and at the same time, there's been a disproportionate uh, deployment of hard security interventions in addressing that, and it has created a paradox which we'll turn to. Um, so, what are the questions that we sought to address? Um, and this is the point I wanted to make here, is that if you look at the years preceding 2020, we have seen a decline, of course. In fact, this is a decade where, our uh, last 20 years is a decade where we were talking about the progress towards democratic consolidation on the African continent. So, how do we then begin to explain what is happening today? And that is why we decided to embark on four questions. The first is, of course, as I said, to look at the development drivers relating to coups. But there's also something happening. This apparent popular support for coups, how do we explain that? Is it a reception towards military rule? Or is it something else? And we wanted to interrogate that question. And of course, what it means for policies and how to ensure that we restore constitutional order. We looked at the literature, and we wanted to provide an analytical framework for understanding coups, noting that no one factor or variable would explain in a convincing way coups. And so we came up with this as our analytical framework. How do you identify triggers? proximate factors, but also structural drivers that could collectively explain coups. Now, you would ask the question, and please don't ask me because I work for a development entity. Don't ask me, where is Wagner Group here? Right? Where is Russia here? Or how do you explain the anti-French sentiment? Well, I'll refer you to, um, I think, page 57 of the report, the main report, not the abridged version. Uh, where we alluded to some of these external externalities associated with uh, the coups. But in a nutshell, here is how we thought it's important to explain. And if you look at the literature on military coups in general, you would find that they allude to some of these different layers. Trigger points, proximate factors, but also institutional drivers. But in addition to what's in the literature, we also wanted to ask citizens what they think. And this is, as my colleague Fatma mentioned, why the report is unique. Harvesting citizens' perception on drivers of coups and how to prevent them. And here are some of the findings that you might find striking. But before I go into that, just what were our case studies? We wanted to adopt a comparative approach, where we looked at countries where we have seen recent incidents of military coups, but countries where we have seen evidence of democratic transition without necessarily placing any value judgment on the quality of democracy in those countries where we have seen democratic transition. So Ghana, Tanzania, and the Gambia, uh, in comparison with countries where we've seen coups. And, and here are some of the findings from the literature. And of course, the young, most of those that were interviewed amongst the 8,000 were largely young people. All right? uh, the average age was 35. And it reflects the demography on the African continent. The first, which we found reassuring, is that this transient popular support for coups is a cry for democratic renewal. It is not necessarily a reception to military regime. And why do we say so? Those 55% of those we interviewed from countries where we have seen recent coups did say that democracy is still preferable. And 67% of those that we interviewed from countries, DTS countries, or democratic transition states, as we refer to them in the report, also highlighted the preference for democracy. That was reassuring, but what was a, a bit more concerning for us was the 17% that said they would prefer a non-democratic government. 
uh, from those countries where we've seen coups. And the 11% from DTS countries that thought a non-democratic option was preferable. So we wanted to go into a bit deeper into the literature. Why would these citizens consider non-democratic option as preferable? Here's what they said. When democracy is abused, and we heard that in the video, 63% of those mentioned that. When there's corruption, when there's insecurity. So democracy that does not deliver for citizens could inherently uh, pose certain risk of instability. And, and that is really a, an important point uh, to make in terms of how democracy needs to move away from strengthening regimes to promoting human security. Now, the second point relates to the correlation between coup risk and underdevelopment. And here, it's very important to note that we do not make a causation argument, right? We are simply saying, what is the positive correlation between coup risk on one hand and uh, persistent underdevelopment? And here's what we found in the literature. Those countries where we have seen recent coups, they ranked incredibly high on fragility index. Don't worry, it's in the report. <laughs> Uh, incredibly high when you look at the fragility index. But at the same time, they ranked very low on the economic freedom index. But there is an exception here, and in retrospect, we've been asking the question, but Gabon, of course we did not include Gabon, this because we did not foresee Gabon, but Gabon seemed to rank high in term, or very low in terms of the fragility index. If you look at Gabon, it's up there. It's close to Mauritius, Seychelles, and, and Tunisia. But the, the point to make here, uh, which again is echoed in the report, is the level of inequality and lack of in inclusion when it comes to political and economic participation. So it actually reinforces the argument that we make in the report. The other side uh, of this debate, when you're looking at the economics, of coups is the economic cost of coups. And we, we, we decided to do a longitudinal study where we looked at the coup in Guinea in 2008, uh, as well as the coup in Mali in 2012, uh, and to assess what did those two events cost the countries. In the case of Guinea, doing counterfactual uh, uh, analysis around economic modeling, $12.1 billion. That is what it cost the country over a five-year period. And in the case of Mali, it was over $13 billion over a five-year period. So there is an economics associated with coups that we also need to address in, in, in terms of how we understand the impact on SDGs. I always say that this is my favorite finding, that the history of coups in those, these countries is likely to increase coup risk. What do we mean by that? If you look at the five countries that have recently experienced coups, as reflected in the report, they have a total combined years of independence of over 300 years. Out of that, they've all experienced military coups for at least 200 years. That is quite striking. And out of this number, 94 years has been when a military ruler has transitioned to a civilian administration. So there's a political culture associated with coups that we need to acknowledge. And it is reflected in citizens Perception. So when we asked citizens to what extent would they tolerate a military takeover, what did they say? 49% of, of those citizens in countries where we've seen recent coups did say it's actually acceptable. So you also see this political socialization that also makes coup receptive as an alternative 
when there is deficiency or at least persistent deficiency. And that's an important point to acknowledge, which the report also talks about. Now we go to the Sahel, where we've seen several coups take place. There is a security paradox here that we need to acknowledge. This is a region where most of the coups have taken place, the region that continues to rank very low when it comes to governance, economic index, when it comes to even inclusion of youth and women in political and economic participation. But at the same time, this is the region that has benefited from some of the most expensive peacekeeping operations. Right? And, and therefore, what we're calling for here in terms of clear recommendation is something that we've been calling for for some time now. It's not a divestment in security interventions, but a proportionate investment in governance and development um, uh, priorities. And this is something that requ is required to reset our intervention in the region in ways that will promote stability. Of course, we talk about the role of men and women. And by the way, it would interest you here that more men are likely to embrace military rule than women, because we also did a gender uh, differentiation in our understanding of um, the gender dynamics around reception to coups. But what is important in terms of this finding is the extent to which um, there's a need for inclusion in political and economic participation as a way to make transition successful. And it's, it's informed how we have conceived of the AFSIT, which I'll come back to a bit later. This point is one I have to communicate. We wanted to know how we are performing as international actors when it comes to uh, response, uh, responses to unconstitutional changes of government and coups in particular. Um, not too well. Uh, we asked citizens to what extent uh, they found UN and regional actors contributing more harm than good in terms of how we've responded. 31% uh, of those that we interviewed did say that the African Union and regional economic communities have not done so well in terms of their responses. In fact, their responses have had a negative impact. And as you know, what has this been? Predominantly, it has been through the uh, adoption of a sanction regime right, in most of these countries. And, and for the UN, 28% of those that we interviewed um, did say that um, uh, our intervention was having a negative impact. And it has also shaped the way we have uh, responded to this recommendation in terms of uh, our offer uh, through the AFSIT. Uh, and, and this is not to be defensive about this, this perception. It's basically to come up with creative ways that appeals to citizens as opposed to one that simply concentrates on those, or of those ad hoc authorities that we are trying to um, uh, engage or ensure that we make that transition to constitutional rule. Now, what does this mean for recommendation? I will come to this because I'm almost ending the presentation. I think for once, um, we cannot stop our analysis. Analysis has to be strengthened, and the way we do our work uh, with regional partners must also be uh, capacitated. And that is why, um, as part of our response, we're calling for the need for a stronger analytical approach that promotes prevention over response mechanisms. And this is something that we'll come back to shortly. The second point is that if you look at the history of military governance in, 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 in politics, there is a need for us to have a shift in terms of how we engage, how we promote civil milit military or civil military interactions. It is one that transcends just doing SSR. There has to be a structured, deliberate, and political conversation between civilians and military elites. It's an important point in terms of our recommendation, and it's one that we are still working with different actors to see how we can operationalize on the ground. The last point is that if you look at the pattern of responses, which probably has shaped civilian perception, 
is that oftentimes once there's a coup and there's an establishment of an ad hoc administration, what do we do? We suspend our support, we withdraw. Um, in the case of Niger right now, um, one international partner has suspended a $900 million uh, operation in, in Niger. We understand the rationale for that, but there is also a much more compelling case for us to stay and deliver for the population without necessarily legitimizing the ad hoc authorities that have taken over power. And, and this is why we're calling for an investment in transition processes that are inclusive and effective. Right? We must stay and deliver for the population, even amidst turbulent transitions. And that's an important point to raise. And this is why, I mean, this point has been talked about by different reports, and I wouldn't go into that. But that's why we're calling for the Africa facility uh, to support inclusive transitions. Because what it, it does is that we've decided to work very closely with a legitimate political institution, the African Union, to begin to operationalize the AFSIT. And the AFSIT would have national windows where we are working through UNDP country offices. We have country offices in all of these countries and beyond uh, to implement and support legitimate roadmaps that seek to drive uh, the restoration of constitutional order, working closely with other UN agencies on the ground. There's an analytical component that would constantly be used to guide policymakers, and there's a regional component that is also useful to enable Afri the African Union and regional economic communities to play their political leadership role even better when it comes to supporting transitions. Ambassador William would speak a bit more about the AFSIT, uh, but I would encourage you to read the report. There's one aspect which I didn't talk about, which is on um, constitutional amendments as a key driver for coups. And we did acknowledge that in our report. Uh, page 34 of the report looks at some of the historical constitutional amendments that we have experienced in recent times on the African continent. Quite sadly, if you transpose that data against the coups that you found or experienced on the African continent today, there is a fair degree of consistency. So that is also an important trigger point for coups. And it calls for the need to strengthen our, our effort to prevent constitutional amendments in ways that would risk destabilizing the country. On that note, thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to your questions. No, thank you so much today. And I think that it's very clear from listening to the presentation why a developmental lens is very important, not only to just frame the discussions, but also to understand the proximate and structural causes, but also that hi um, the history of military governance is also very critical. So Jide, you touch upon many different elements to develop a coup prevention agenda. So luckily here we've got a great panel to help us unpack this discussion even further. We've got Ambassador William Awinador, who's a seasoned veteran um, Ghanaian diplomat who's currently serving as a senior advisor uh, to the Commissioner of Political Affairs, Peace and Security at the African Union. We've got Ulf Schalstig, who is the head of Africa Department at CEDA, who also can further expand on the developmental perspective. And Jesper Bjansen, who is a currently a senior researcher at the Nordic Africa Institute, who can also unpack the West Africa context further. So, Ambassador William, perhaps we'll start with you. So, the report talks about this ephemeral initial popularity of coup, coup plotters. Shouldn't this serve as a rallying call for governments to really listen to these people and also demonstrate inclusive and principled governments? So it would be keen to hear from you on how can regional responses to coups be more effective? Yeah. Thank you very much, Fatima. After encouraging me with the correct pronunciation of my difficult surname, I noticed you left half of it for <laughs> safety. But... Uh, um, after being one of the few who actually pronounced it correctly. But on a serious note, let me begin by thanking the uh, director from CEDA for graciously 
creating this useful platform to enable uh, UNDP and the African Union engage with our friends and partners, both from the governmental side and the non-state actor side. On, uh, on a project that's important as what we are going to discuss. And secondly, to bring you the special greetings of my commissioner, Ambassador Bankole Adioye, I mean, uh, who has a very uh, Im important approach to an all society approach of doing business in order for the AU to make itself as relevant as it possibly can for the good of Africa and for the good of humanity. And Sweden has a special role to play in this regard, not only because you represent part of this great uh, Nordic model of governance that we are here to leverage adequately, and hopefully this initiative will help us to do more of that, but also because of your direct collaboration uh, with us, the African Union, and uh, our member states. Uh, for the commissioner, uh, one of his key priorities is uh, bridging the gap between knowledge policy and implementation. And uh, talking about knowledge research uh, feeding into knowledge I mean, creation. And that is why, with the support of the chairperson of the commission and the deputy chairperson, uh, he has helped to create what we call the Net for Peace, which brings together knowledge communities in Africa, not only to engage amongst themselves in support of the commission, but also to build bridges with uh, con uh, other continental entities like CIPRI, uh, um, your organization, Nordic African Institute, um, uh, UN Inst US Institute for Peace, uh, um, the European Network for Peace, and among others, in support of Africa, but also for uh, knowledge-based policy making on the global um, scale, which is we need now more than ever if you consider what is going on. There is an Asian saying that um, challenges are also opportunities. I think it's attributed to China. And what my brother Gide just did was to remind us that when we have challenges and we try to throw a searchlight on it, it must be backed up by action. And the concept or project of AFSIT um, has been packaged in such a way that it has been infused with a knowledge approach, which is this research report that GD has so ably presented, in order to underpin the knowledge approach to implementation, uh, which is the AFSIT joint project between the African Union and UNDP. So to answer your question directly now with these preliminaries, uh, let me approach it from three angles. First, a, a brief background and trend and also some uh, basic assumptions and what exactly we could do to improve it within five minutes, as you said, isn't it? Yeah, so basically, if you look at the African landscape over the years, we experienced uh, a post-colonial type of governance that was uh, ideologically driven in this cold world era of one-party state and military regimes, uh, both of them responding to the one-party state concept of centralized governance. And subsequently, with the collapse of the Berlin Wall, and more importantly, the collapse of apartheid, the OAU transitioned into AU, adopted certain key strategies and mechanisms, particularly the African peer review mechanism and NEPAD, in order to build a new Africa that had resilient institutions and that was democratic. And so we had this uh, process which led into military coup, one-party states receding. Now, GD referenced West Africa as the epicenter. And I think West Africa was the, also the epicenter at the time of this progress. So here we are a resurgence, as Gide I mean, said. Um, and that is a trend in which we found ourselves. ECOWAS tried to respond uh, to that resurgence, but it doesn't look like it's working. Because right from Mali, we went on to Burkina, went on to Guinea, uh, Niger, and uh, recently 
uh, what do you call it, uh, other African country, Gabon, which took many by surprise, uh, although others also it wasn't so much of a surprise. But, uh, so basically, before I share what we could do better, let me share some perspectives on certain things I call givens. The first given is that we all appreciate democracy and that, as Gide said, it's a no to military coup. But the AU says no to that military and constitutional change, and in addition, civilian and constitutional change. The two go together and cannot be separated. To separate them is to diminish our response mechanism. Second, it is the national stakeholders of a country that can work to effectively prevent civilian or military coup d'etat. The role of Rex and the African Union is to support that process, not to replace it. The Rex do not have that capacity, nor the continent, to replace them. And it's not even desirable. Building a state and a nation is the responsibility of national stakeholders, first and foremost, just like R2P, responsibility to protect. It's the responsibility of the state. It is only when things get out of hand that you come in. I think uh, that needs to be uh, prioritized uh, moving forward. So what can we do then as Rex and also as uh, uh, the continental body to help the member states effectively address this? I think we need to have clear value systems that we prioritize and share to move forward. And just to give an example, um, 2018 July, the heads of states of ECOWAS and ECAS met in Lome, Togo, and uh, came out with a declaration on peace, security, terrorism, and violent extremism. That outcome document is little known, surprisingly. And in one of the recommendations or decisions of that declaration was to call on the two secretariats or commissions of ECOWAS and ECAS. And by the way, this was heavily supported technically by the UN. You know CAS in Libreville, you know us in Dakar. The call was for the two to initiate action to come out with a draft document that will help this larger space of ECAS and ECOWAS to agree on constitutional convergence principles. This is 2018. That is yet to happen due to a number of factors. And who knows, if it had happened as the heads of state desired with the support of the UN, maybe, just maybe, we will not be where we are sitting today in terms of the focus of the, the uh, discussion. So agreeing those shared value systems is going to be critical uh, at the regional level and at the continental level. And we have the frameworks, legal, from 2000 OAU um, uh, protocol on unconstitutional changes of government up to date, among others, to be able to do that. So why is it not happening? Perhaps also it's because of uh, the need for us to prioritize leadership and consistency in what we do, whether it's in the process of institutional reforms or in the normal situation. And if you take the epicenter of uh, coup d'etat, as Gide said, you know that that has been one of the deficits that needs to be addressed and addressed early before things really get out of hand. And creating the appropriate synergy between the REC and the Continental Body, AU, PS, and Security Council is going to be critical. Because another challenge we face is the principle of subsidiarity, which should not be allowed to be used to slow down the process of synergy building and to allow the AU to play its overall mandate 
of overseeing the peace and security process of the continent. Just like the UN Peace and Security Council has primary responsibility at the global level, the AU has it for the continental. So how do you manage subsidiarity so that it doesn't stand in the way of optimal AU Rex um, synergy uh, moving uh, forward? Uh, another uh, thing we need to do is to prioritize the nexus approach which this report speaks to the issue of the nexus between peace, security, governance, and development has been very key in the issue of unconstitutional changes of government, and even terrorism, our other uh, security challenge. And uh, more specifically, the sanctions regimes. The uh, Malabo Extraordinary Summit of the African Union last year uh, preceded by the Accra Forum, which came out with the Accra Declaration that brought together state and non-state actors which prepared the Malabo Summit. Because the Malabo Summit considered that declaration, uh, um, the Accra meeting was sanctioned by the AU Peace and Security Council. The summit called for the relevant PSC Committee on Sanctions to be revived. And I think that one of the things they also look at is the effective functioning of the sanctions regime. Some argue, and one is tempted to agree, that the way we operate our sanctions regime in parts of Africa is rather punishing vulnerable citizens than those who should be targeted. And so to continue in that mechanical and sometimes rather uh, uh, emotional approach is not helping us to address effectively this I mean, issue. So that calls for serious uh, reflection and the Northern African Institute among others like CIPRI through the Net for Peace in, uh, exchange can also help in uh, ventilating the subject to help not just Africa but also globally because uh, usually our partners are in solidarity with Africa when it comes to sanctions. But it should be knowledge I mean, uh, based. Then the communication strategy. We need to improve our communication strategy. Uh, because of time, I'll just leave it at that. And last but not least, working methods. Consistency also speaks to working methods. And when you look closely at some of our actions, the working methods need to be fine-tuned. I'll leave it at that. And in conclusion, to say this, uh, GDM reference human security, you also have the Human Development Index, all from UNDP. If you combine that with the Nexus approach, which the African Union is uh, prioritizing now, because if you recall last year in Tangier, with the support of uh, UNECA, UNDP, African Development Bank, and Africa Zim Bank, we had the first Nexus conference in Tangier, Morocco. Uh, and, uh, if you take that nexus, take the human security aspect and human development index, that will help us in effectively addressing the challenges of uh, unconstitutional changes of government and security challenge of uh, I mean, terrorism. And to add to that, one African saying, which is an Akan saying from Ghana, that if you are cutting a path, it is those who behind you who can tell you how straight or how crooked the path is. And when you look at the setting here, those of us who are seated here, the light is on us. I think you have better eyes than me. I'm actually struggling because I have cat's eyes. So when the light is very bright, I struggle to see. But the others who are there, they see us clearer than we can see them. That should be the relationship between the political leaders, public servants, and the citizens. The citizens on that side, they should be able to see every side of us, no shady deals, and hold us to account in real time uh, moving forward. So this should be the thrust, and I would like to appeal to all of us then to join UNDP and the African Union in concretizing this strategic innovative project that we call AFSET. Mm -hmm. Because for those of us who have followed it closely, this can be a game changer if we are to reverse the resurgence of unconstitutional changes of government and also to address the other accompanying security challenges of terrorism, among others. 
So let me reiterate my appeal to you to be our voices, not only in Sweden, but also in the Nordic countries and in the European Union as well, and also at the UN, to make UPSIT a reality and move us forward because peace and security in Africa is peace and security in the world. The two cannot be separated, just like uh, you face challenges of migration. When we deal with our terrorist situation and our other conflict challenges, invariably the issue of migration will be addressed. And I would like to remind us that ECOWAS tried that with Spain and it was moving very well, but for some reason, we seem to have lost control. So thank you. Yeah. I, I, Fatima, I can see you raise your hand. Yeah. Sorry for being so long, but this is a subject that evokes emotions when you see the potential and what we can do out of it. Thank no, you for your patience. Thank you so much, Ambassador William. And I think you raise a lot of important points, especially the fact that the normative frameworks exist, uh, but that we need leadership and consistency. So I think you've clearly articulated that Politics cannot, development cannot happen, occur in a vacuum. So coming back to the developmental approach, I'd be keen to hear from you, how do you see that development can provide solutions to coups and crisis, in particular in the African context? Oh. Development can provide solutions. That, that's a faulty statement. Mm. Politics is what is the basis for coups or not coups. Ownership in Africa, by African colleagues is what can drive coups or drive development. What, from a development partner's perspective, what we can do is to try to enhance the speed by working with colleagues in Africa for Africa. As Gide correctly said, I mean, the Afrobarometer has shown for years the preference for democracy is there. Mm -hmm. Who wouldn't like to be an agent of change in your own life? We all would like to be. So, so, so that's the develop, de developmental perspective, but you can't separate it from security and the political will. So, so, so that's the difference, and I think that's what, where we really have to, year by year, play um, our game together. So working with the Africa Union and working with the RECs over the last 20 years in different roles, this is so critical for us. And the more the Africa Union and the RECs can combine their efforts, make the subsidiarity work in a good way, the more we have the opportunity to, to invest in that. It's also a, a question of political power, because we've seen now this, the trend of coups again that we hoped we would never see again. And of course, having one coup in a country is, as Gide said, a risk of having another one. But it's also an example for other countries that it's possible. And breaking that trend is not the developmental partners issue. That is really the joint power of the governments in Africa, relying on the citizens' will to be an agent in his or her life. And of course, we will, as much as we can from a technical perspective, support the AU and other partners in doing so, and are really happy for the efforts that are made. But also, when we say, look at the headline, soldiers and citizens, military coups and the need for democratic renewal in Africa. This looks like it's a westernized report. It's 54 countries, at least, and territories. And if you look at that, there's a smaller number of countries that has been affected by this coup trend. At the same time, we have a current count after the election in, in Liberia, which is very tight and so far very promising. They are moving from fragility into something else, hopefully. We have Zambia with the more than 30 years now tradition of democratic elections that are tight, but still the youth have now expressed their will. We have a, a, a newly uh, elected democratic government working on the development there. So we have other trends. It's not one trend in Africa. It's not one trend in Europe. There are different trends, and we have to work with those trends and see the opportunities where they are. It's a shorter reply, but not maybe a comprehensive one. <laughs> no, but I think you speak on the importance of the engagement of civilians, and it's not just one trend. And I think 
Coming back to the center of this report and application of the people-centered lens, uh, Jasper, we'd be keen to hear from you. What does it mean in practice to adopt a people-centered lens? Mm. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, to me, as an anthropologist doing qualitative research, I think the first kind of people-centering that I think of is a more of a methodological one. Uh, so I do appreciate the, the sort of the solid methodology of this report. Um, and and uh, I think working with qualitative research, the, the key of doing a people-centered approach is to try to suspend your own prejudice, your own expectations, and be willing to actually listen and maybe even change your perception of things. And I think uh, that is key also to political and diplomatic actors at this point. Uh, especially relating to this fear of military coups, primarily in West Africa. I think there's a need to uh, listen not only to the actors we agree with, but also the actors we don't agree with, or the actors we don't understand, and to humanize uh, all actors in that process. Uh, I think there's a lot of conflict-related research showing that Development is also a driver of recruitment into armed groups uh, historically in, in Africa's civil wars, for example. Uh, and I think there's a need to understand the actors currently destabilizing uh, the West African democracies uh, in that spirit of a people-centered approach. So the second kind of dimension is definitely political. I think the, the, the will to listen to what people are actually experiencing uh, also uh, goes for their expectations of um, not just their elected leaders, but all the actors in their everyday lives that affect their livelihoods, their possibilities for living dignified uh, and sustainable lives. And from my experience working in West Africa, I would say that people are generally quite used to a pluralism. There isn't just one representative of the state. There isn't just one actor representing an access to security, an access to justice, an access to even livelihoods. There's often a plethora of different actors. And I think a people-centered approach to me speaks to that observation that it's important to take seriously that we can't expect people, especially in the middle of the Sahel region under its current sort of uh, escalating security crisis and political destabilization to, to pick democracy first, for example. Um, I think it's important to take a point of departure in people's everyday lives and those hardships. And what is not being talked very much about, I feel, still, is the still growing humanitarian crisis in that region, in addition to the rise of, of what we can call jihadist violence, uh, for, for lack of a more nuanced term. So I think uh, understanding the realities of both people forced to leave their homes because of violence and those communities facing a situation where thousands of displaced people are entering the community in need of support is part of that people-centered approach. And I would take that then as a final sort of uh, dimension, which is the more socioeconomic one, because clearly, as, as the report also shows, and as Gida said, uh, military coups are expensive or they're costly. And so, uh, so is the security situation in the Sahel. Um, so there's a clear need, as you say, to, to remain and deliver, uh, to not get ca caught up in the geopolitics of what is happening in West Africa now uh, and risk isolating not just uh, military governments but also the population that, that is sort of expecting us to... Uh, uh, engage in, in uh, their plight. I think that's why the UNDP is, is, and CEDA and other development actors are in an important position right now because the political situation is so tense mm. and so polarized that a development lens might help defuse that kind of politics. Uh, I was lucky enough to be a part of a, a similar seminar on a previous UNDP report on undocumented migrants in Europe, and we had a similar kind of conversation around the need for a development lens when politics becomes so polarizing that it's difficult to really uh, make any headway. Mm. Uh, so I think that's why the sort of the, the focus on sustainable development it, it can be extremely important here, 
uh, to also challenge diplomatic actors in their approach to dealing with military governments and other armed actors in West Africa uh, in, in the interest of, of the broader population of that uh, region. Yeah. No, thank you so much. And I think what has been clear from these discussions is that the combined approach, the nexus approach is critical and really looking at the political aspects and the development aspects together and placing uh, and understanding the people's approaches and also their own perspectives. Now, we want to open this up and we have 10 minutes to really engage and answer some of the questions, further interrogate the report um, with this great panelist. So um, the floor is open. Uh, please, uh, I think there is a roaming mic, but uh, state your name and your question. Um, we'll start here, uh, the front row. Let's come on. Thank you. It's not on, yeah. It's on. Uh, also, Smedler, I have also had an, uh, s some professional experience from working in Africa, both regionally and as resident coordinator. Um, in the presentation and the discussion that we have now listened to, uh, there is a, a factor that was touched upon very briefly, and it is the role of women. Uh, you will all recall uh, that on the 25th every year, there is an annual discussion of the Women, Peace and Security agenda in the Security Council. Um, today, it will become even more important to discuss the ways that you strengthen women's participation. And here are factors which are extremely important. For instance, access to information, access to techniques to uh, both uh, mediate and participate in uh, discussions and de decision making. Um, and uh, that was one of the questions, how do you propose to address the situation of women, peace and security? And I had a little question, especially to you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, in the early 2000s, there was a very interesting initiative which was called African Peer Review Mechanism. Indeed. Is there any uh, continuation on that and what can be? I had a very positive in, uh, experience from following, but uh, I'm not in the picture right now. How do you use it? We can take a few more. Um, one in the back over there, the gentleman. In the first row. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Nair. I came from uh, an organization for human rights activity. I would like to ask you first for the researchers on the topic about military groups and the need for democratic renewal in Africa post-African uh, states, this uh, 54, when they began their independence, I think it, it is from the very beginning, state structure and the participation of the civil society. Now you said soldiers and citizens after the coups in West Africa, West Africa, if the conflict is between the soldiers and citizens, what do you have for the future at, to make them sit and perform dialogue? If the conflict is between the soldiers and citizens, what do you have for the next program as researchers? My, address, uh, my question is addressed to the researchers of these findings. I have not read the report, but I will follow the report Perhaps I will mail my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Any more in the back? Otherwise, we'll go to the front. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. Uh, so, Pontus Orsted from the Folke Bernadot Academy. Um, so uh, thanks for an excellent presentation and a, uh, and a very interesting and, and timely um, report. Um, I wanted to 
follow up a little bit more on here, a little bit more around the element of security or human security. Um, it, I find the argument um, that there's, of course, this is a call for, in a way, democratic renewal related to all of this and frustrations in terms of the development gains that have happened um, in Africa that is sort of underlying here. But um, the human security element perhaps is one of the more proximate causes, and you see that even in your own research in terms of what is the difference between those countries that have had unconstitutional change and those that haven't. It's when the human security or the security element becomes acute. Um, a little more reflection on how you have found that and what can be done in terms of the um, conflict prevention agenda, perhaps, uh, to uh, manage um, the threats to the democratic systems. So we have two more questions as well that we've received online from the online audience. Uh, but before we do, Axel, we have one more from the uh, on the second row, and then we'll go back to our panelists. Uh, thank you, uh, Asrar Ahmed. Uh, I just want, would like to question the report. So uh, it was mentioned, what is the definition of the military coup? Because I saw Sudan name here, and um, mm -hmm. on all of the UN reports, it's written right now, it's a military takeover. It's not anymore a military coup. Because the definition of the military coup, that when military take over the power on an elected government. So um, so did this, did this report cover uh, this differentiation from military coup and uh, military takeover. Thank you. And then so for the audience, um, uh, the online audience, we have also two more questions. So the first one it asks, what are the impacts of these coups to migration within West Africa and migration out of the continent? Um, another question also raises about the role of aid and the developmental perspective, but I believe this has already been addressed. Um, but the finally, also around IT, what is the role of social media in coup context and what can be done to inform young social media users um, in terms of misinformation and disinformation? So I think we have a mix of questions, both in terms of how we do we define military coups, understanding the methodology, the role of APRM, and also how do we strengthen women's participation? So perhaps we can... Start with you, Jade, and then go to the discussants. Thank you. Can I? Okay. Thank you so much for the questions. I, I think the question around uh, women participation is such an important one, and I, I think there are two pathways to addressing that. The first is if you look at most of the coups that have been uh, successful or not successful, uh, they've been largely. Um, planned and uh, initiated by men. And, and if you then try to look at the ambition of UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which calls for uh, increased women participation and representation in security institutions, it is even more compelling today. Um, in fact, when we presented this, uh, uh, at Chatham House, uh, the report recently at Chatham House, um, one of the expert participants did actually make the argument that don't you think that by increasing the re representation of women uh, in security institutions and in leadership positions within those security institutions, you can de-risk uh, the likelihood for coups? And it's an important conversation to have, so I do agree with you. But on the other hand, and beyond representation in security institutions, what you also find is that the quality and quantity of women participation in, in political platforms is also limited, um, especially during, before, during, and even after transition. So if you look at the case of Chad, um, we had to work very closely with women platforms uh, through some of the methods that you've highlighted in ensuring that we encouraged participation through these women platforms so that they could be actively engaged in the transition process. Um, the same thing we did in the case of Mali, 
where we were working very closely with WANEP uh, to encourage and build platforms of women organizations so that they can participate in the transition processes. But this is not necessarily a desired end state. There is still a lot of work to be done through building capacity of women, supporting them financially, promoting literacy in some of the uh, political processes uh, in ways that they can actively engage. Um, and, and this is partly what I think ACID seeks to do. That is one of the entry points for supporting those that are not necessarily fully involved in, 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 in transition processes, uh, including youth as well. Um, so in the case of Mali, we provided support uh, to opposition political parties to be able to participate in the national dialogue process, right? And, and those are the entry points that we see are valuable in, in promoting a, a much more inclusive uh, dialogue. In terms of the question around uh, uh, human security, I, I, I think the overarching point to make is that if you invest appropriately in governance, you reduce the risk of instability. And, and the reason why I say that is that I think over time, I think at the heart of this in terms of addressing the structural drivers of instability broadly, and this is beyond unconstitutional changes of government in the form of military coups, is that we see that a common denominator across all of this context is the persistent governance deficit. Governance in some of these countries are not addressing the aspirations of young people jobs, livelihood opportunities, uh, providing spaces for political and economic participation, right? And fundamentally, therefore, if you're able to boost governance and you ensure that there's much more deliberacy in how you address those deficits, you begin to actually inadvertently promote regime security. So it's not so much about human security here. I think regime security is no longer uh, achieved by simply promoting a, a repressive regime or trying to isolate citizens from you know, political participation. The reverse is the case. If you really want to promote regime security today, you would have to necessarily have to invest in governance, right? And, and that is what we are seeing from the, from the report um, that uh, has been said. We did not look at this question around. It's an interesting one to look at, but we did not look at this nexus between coups and migration, and, and neither did we look at the question around social media, but certainly there could be a potential, there, there could be a relationship, but it's not something that we looked at in the report. Great, yeah. so maybe one minute reflection and answers. Um, sure, both. I can jump in, I mean, uh, thanks for a lot of interesting questions. On the women, peace and security, of course, uh, CEDA as a development agency are always looking at gender equality, whatever we do, wherever we go. And I think we need to be more doing that. Because if we would have truly democratic elections anywhere, there would be a majority of women voting. And I don't see that many vim female pre presidents yet. So there is something missing here. And I also would like to agree on the fact that governance is so important. Because if you look at the... These countries, I was recently in Mopti in, in Mali. I mean, there is no government presence in the north. Mm. So, so who are we talking about? Which accountability? To whom? Mm. So, so of course, that is the, the working on, on governance, on institutions, which is a tedious work over time, to not say generations, is, I think, what, what can really, in the long run, create that opportunity for government. And then at the same time, of course, working with the people out in the country. And basically there is a combination of, you say, human security, I mean, security and food, and my ability to have economic freedom. Because then I can be part of a society, and I see a trend in some of the countries where we work, where we are going more and more back to work with local government and local regions and districts of a country because it's like in this retraction we need to start over again and work and support it very, very locally to build it bit by bit up. 
And finally, we will reach the African peer review mechanism, <laughs> which I'll hand over to William, <laughs> what we've been supporting over the years. Yeah. <laughs> no, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so uh, the part which was addressed to me, I mean, which uh, my colleague has already answered uh, in terms of women, peace and security. Let me quickly add to that uh, before I come to APRM. Uh, my commissioner um, uh, prioritizes uh, gender mainstreaming, and this is in sync with a larger AU approach, which is also nudged by the UN. And if you compare the AU with the RECs, you will notice that when it comes to gender mainstreaming, even institutional, the AU is ahead. Um, and then you ask yourself, um, the same member states that come to take decisions at the African Union, they go back to their RECs, why is there a gap between rep practice and AU practice? Mm. So to give an example, ECOWAS that I'm more familiar with, uh, if you look at the makeup of the ECOWAS commission and compare it to the AU commission, you don't see any parity. Um, so why is it so? Um, they are part of AU, they are able to do it at the AU, so why can't they do it at the REC level, and this is what we're referencing earlier on, these uh, disparities between RECs and the AU, we need to address I mean, them. Uh, what you do at the top and pack at the bottom, and particularly unpack, as he said, at the local uh, level, uh, which is very key, and is going to be very key in the implementation of AFSID in terms of institutional resilience capacities. The local level is going to be uh, critical. Um, and um, if you look at the European Union setup, you notice that local level has been mainstreamed. With this, your knowledge approach of the concept of multi-level governance, where you have the uh, decentralized level, the national level, into the body of the European Union, which we need to bring also as an awareness in our setup in the African Union. Uh, and when you look at the African Union, the way we started, unlike the EU, it wasn't based on agreed value systems membership. It was geographic automatic. And that makes our process more challenging. And for that matter, we need to do more work. And that is why APRM was so critical that with the collapse of apartheid in South Africa, what became clear was that uh, African stakeholders, especially non-state actors and the youth, were going to be more demanding, inward-looking uh, of their states in terms of democracy and accountability. And so it's, it was not by accident that APRM and um, South Africa opted to host it together with NEPAD. Uh, at the beginning, and your question is, uh, what is happening? The enth it's still m very much alive, but the question is, the same enthusiasm that brought in APRM, is this still this, uh, persistent? I'm afraid to say that that enthusiasm has waned somehow, and that is regrettable. It is the most critical entry point to consolidating democracy and inclusive governance, but it is the most difficult also, because nothing good comes easy. Uh, so we need to use this kind of momentum that is going to be created by AFSID to also help energize the APRM. There is also another challenge of institutional theft protection, which is not a monopoly of the African Union or the RECs in Africa. We see it elsewhere, even at the UN, theft protection. So sometimes uh, certain individuals have different understandings of the role of public service and the role of the institution, and their uh, approach to work makes uh, reforms and change very difficult. One of the priorities of the commissioner is change management with the support of GIZ. And I saw a similar exercise at ECOWAS when Dr. Chambers was there. Extremely, one of the most difficult things I've come across is change management. Anywhere, whether it's at the UN, at the AU, at the REC, or at the national um, uh, level, but it's a compelling exercise. So I'm happy you've referenced APRM. We still have it. Some countries are 
acceding to it I mean, uh, from north all the way down to the south, east and west. But the momentum has waned and we need to re-energize it. Who should do that? It is the national stakeholders. And that is why sometimes I have a challenge with non-state actors who put all the blame on political leaders. Even they exclude public servants who can sometimes be highly mischievous in terms of consolidating democracy and uh, reforms. Public servants, they don't often come under the searchlight. It's usually the political leaders where the searchlight is. So uh, non-state actors need to help to ensure that both political leaders and public servants come under scrutiny. We must all be made a a accountable. But for now, we look at political leaders. Even looking at political leaders, what is happening? They elect or we elect leaders, wait for five, four years, for hoping that new leaders will come and bring about change. But in terms of real-time accountability, very often it's just about talking yeah. and creating heat. And then in the night, going to take uh, envelopes from politicians and pretend to be shouting with the rest and uh, that kind of thing. That is part of the problem of unconstitutional changes of government, which we don't seem to realize, that the non-state actors must also look inwards when they are holding politicians to account. That is a shared responsibility and not just some people's responsibility and to unpack leadership correctly, leadership at every level. Lastly, and this brings me to the European Union Africa model. Uh, everywhere in, in integration, you must have pivotal members of the integration process. In Europe, you have France and Germany who have played that role. You ask yourself, in Africa, are they not there? Yes, they are there. Are they playing that role? Yes, they are playing that role. Are they recognized to be playing that role? That is where I have. I see a, a challenge. Let me rest my case because yeah. I can see Fatima. Yeah, thank you. And I, this just shows how stimulating these discussions are. But unfortunately, we have exceeded our time. But um, I think this just points that we all need to read the report and to continue the conversations as well. But please join me in thanking our great panelists. And uh, this brings us to a close. <laughs>